it's a much larger contract than you ever would have started with in the first place because trust has been built. Hello, hello, hello. It's Holly Rustic here with Grant Writing and Funding, and I'm super happy to help you grow capacity, increase funding, and advance mission of the nonprofits that you work with or that you work inside of. So really exciting this week because I have, like, you know, your twins out there in the world that you kind of run into in certain ways. I have her on the podcast today, so I'm really excited. And this is Meredith Noble. She is the co-founder at Learn Grant Writing. Super excited to have you on the podcast today. You've also secured $42 million in grants and your collective of grant writers that you coach have also collectively uh, secured $627 million in grant mm-hmm. in Alaska, which is pretty fun because I'm over here on Guam and I feel like we kind of talk the same geographically separated language. So welcome, Meredith. Welcome to the Grant Writing Funny Podcast. Oh, Holly, thank you so much. When I was just getting started, you were the OG in the space. I'm like, she's doing it. She's teaching grant writing online. Like, I want to I want to grow up and be that. So this is totally cool. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Sometimes I'd be like, I'm just over here, you know. You know Plug it along. You never know, right? Who sees you? It's so funny. So, oh my gosh. And we both, you know, another fun fact is we both have books on grant writing. We do. So like, yeah. Yes, and I was like, oh, yeah, who's this girl? That's actually where exactly. I first found you. Yeah. Cause I was like, oh, there's another book out there. And then I was like, oh, cool. So it was really fun to see. Like, we both published around the same time, I think. Did we? I was wondering. Yeah. I remember seeing yours first. So yours had yeah. been out earlier. Yeah, I just felt like we needed to take down the number one book because I hate that book. Oh, it's that not book. great. I do not enjoy it. I don't think yeah. it's a, a book that grant writers need. And so I was like, we need more people to be writing on this topic. So it's yeah. so dense. It's so dense. It's so right? dense. I'm like, this yeah, is not yeah. how grant writers are going to learn. This is not the answer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it's a lot of fun. And then I, I heard about you, I believe, at the GBA conference back in 2019. And I think I was talking to Angela um, Guerin of Instrumental, oh, yeah. and she was saying, oh, there's another book out in the space, and they talk about Instrumental, and I believe that she was talking about yours, so I was like, oh, how funny, so it was just Yeah, like- Gowrie's quote is on the back of my book, which is great. I mean, I was actually filming my original grant writing course, the one that sold like $2,000 worth, like it was a total epic flop, but when I was doing the filming for how to do funding research... I stumbled accidentally upon instrumental and then I was down the rabbit hole. I had to stop recording and I'm like, oh, this actually changes everything. No, we're not doing grant research the way I've been doing it. This is the way to do it. And I had to completely relearn, like, what is this new software? And back then they were just a startup. Like I was directly giving them feedback. You probably were too. Like we were giving them feedback as some of their first users, which is such an abstract thought. (laughs) Yeah, they were so new. They were just kind of doing like coffee things at the GPA conference and like, you know, it was like super chill, but it was really interesting to be like, okay, who's going to be there? Who can I talk to to get on the podcast? So they've been on the podcast as well and like connecting that way and who's really coming up in this industry, such a good platform. But um, going sideways now, you also do a lot with, you know, like you said, you started doing on demand grant writing. Is that kind of where you started? Can you, can you tell us your origin story? (laughs) Oh yes, let me do it because everybody has a story and it never looks, I think so often you look at the businesses Holly and I have and Mm -hmm. compare to our chapter eight or nine, your chapter one. And Mm -hmm. it's just an unfair comparison because let us assure you, we had scraps that we had to throw out that were completely not useful. It has been a journey. So Oh, for sure. For (laughs) sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in 2018, I quit my corporate grant writing job pledged to never write another grant again. And mm-hmm. I launched this, this sexy startup idea, which I barely talk about because I'm still kind of embarrassed. And three months later, I really discovered that I had an empty piggy bank and no traction. And I recognized that just because you have an idea, if it is not solving a problem uh, yeah. that people are willing to pay for, mm-hmm. it can be a great idea, but it simply isn't actually solving a problem. And so that kind of goes back to a lot of where I see the origin story of a lot of nonprofit efforts. I'm like, Hey, let's make sure we're grounding our ideas in a problem. And it's a solution to a problem versus just being this great idea we've come up with. So, but at this point I'm three months in, I've experienced lifestyle freedom. 
I know what it means to go take two hours off in the middle of the day, especially here in Alaska when we don't have a lot of sunlight in the winter. Like if I can go do a little Nordic ski for a couple hours and then still work, I couldn't do that in a normal job. So there's really no going back. And Mm -hmm. I start grant writing consulting on the side because I'm like, well, I do know how to do it. So here we go. And I piece together whatever projects and money I could get in that first year of business. Mm -hmm. And one of them was going back home to my family's cattle ranch because it was calving season. That's when the cows are having their babies. So this time of the year. Side note, Meredith is a cowgirl from Wyoming. (laughs) Yes, fifth generation cattle rancher. I know you never guess. I don't really sport my Western attire very often, but, (laughs) and, um, So I'm sitting out there dragging the hay fields. It's literally when you drive around the trip, the fields with these tires that are cut in half that are like the Olympic rings and they Mm -hmm. break up the manure into smaller pieces, which is a natural fertilizer. And you're literally going in circles for hours and hours and hours. Like this is what I'm doing. And while I was out there, it occurred to me, what if I could teach grant writing online and, and, and like, I could, I could do that. I wonder if this is possible. And then that's what led to, okay, well, I'm going to start, I'm going to start this out. But of course it was an epic failure the first round because I had no idea what I was doing and made every mistake you can make. (laughs) Yep. Mm -hmm. That's how you learn though. Like, I feel like there, you know, like there has to be sometimes there's, when you're trying new things, you're going to stumble and fail and the outcome isn't always going to be the same. Right. So even when making goals, it's nice to like have quarterly reviews and even monthly reviews to kind of see where your targets are. Right. So I think that's like really the, when I look at my career and like when I had step change moments or when I had a real breakthrough, it's because I had a coach. It's yeah. because I had, yeah. I, I signed up for, you know, Amy Porterfield's program of how to build an online course yeah. or yeah. like, you know, right. Well, I like, that one too. Yeah, it was so great. <laughs> She's just I'm still type A and I love it. So Mm -hmm. it was just this, there were these moments, the moments I stopped trying to do it all the hard way and do it all myself would Mm -hmm. be the moments I'd have a major breakthrough. And that's what I think you and I both pride ourselves on now. It's like, Hey, you don't actually have to build a grant writing consulting business over 10 years of struggle. You can get up and running or scale it like right now, but let us prevent you from making many of the common mistakes you will otherwise make. Right. So I do think that that is what I would attribute sort of the breakthrough moments Mm-hmm. Two, what is, is everyone needs a good coach. Everyone needs a great mentor. I love that so much. Yeah. And I, you know, I always have a coach too, and it could be for a certain thing. Like I have a book coach and I have a business coach, right. You know what I mean? So there's yeah. like different kind of aspects that you can look for as far as like exactly. ones that you really want to specifically build. Right. So, and I think that's so important. Um, right now I'm going through a, a scale with a coach with scaling and it's so much fun and just to that's get the tools yeah and get the tools so I don't have to do those SOPs like I don't have to do you know you have to work on some of them but at least you have templates and you have things and you have resources and you have you know just that kind of that ability to to have a guidance right and just to and mindset I think is the biggest thing like oh my right. goodness Ab- absolutely absolutely yeah. and new levels new devils folks like you think yeah. you've made your mindset breakthrough well you're gonna arrive at a new one um can I just share a story about that yes yes okay too. so in 2018 when I first started the business I read this Forbes article that less than two percent of women-owned founders break a million in revenue mm-hmm. and three times as many male-owned companies do And I thought that is just atrocious. I'm going to do my part to hit that figure and then blow that wider and bigger for more women to pass through. And of course, when you pay yourself a salary of like $25,000 in year one, being a million dollar company feels really far away, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But to still have that as like my guiding North star of like, we're going to get there, not for the money, but for what it symbolizes. Right, right. Became It helped me filter and make decisions for the years to come. Mm -hmm. So last year we, we hit it. We like finally became a million dollar company. Yay. Thank you. Yes. Um, And I lost my pizzazz and I didn't know like, where do I take us now? And I had no vision and it was, and I felt literally like I was smashing into the ceiling of my Mm -hmm. own making because I had done no visualization of where next, because picking an arbitrary dollar amount didn't feel like the next thing. And so it's just fascinating. Like it took a while to kind of like tether apart some of the like money mindset issues that were in my way, or just like how I try to find like the love again, uh, in your business and what you do. And I found it and we punched through it, but it didn't come. It took a good year, a good year of discomfort 
to have that breakthrough moment where now the ceiling is way higher, but it happened. Right. You have to be, I think that's why vision is so important. I'm sure you could talk about that. Like your, your business vision has changed over time. Would you oh, say? Yeah. 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 And even like what you're talking about, as far as, you know, those monetary goals, it is, it's like, cause you're so focused on it, right? The affirmation and the belief and the vision board and all the things, right. And it's beautiful. But like, when you hit that, then you're like, okay, now, yeah, I've, I've been in the same situation. I even yeah, ran, I've ran a marathon before, like one. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, this is Good like, on you. Done. Now what? I've been on all this train and now I've got nothing, right? You know, so it's kind of like what, it's like these goals, right? So I think that's really important. And I love that you did that, especially, I just want to, on the side, like say this out loud is for women, because I'm all about that yes. too. Our industry, I know you are, and that's what I appreciate yeah. about you. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Because it is, it's so important. Like those stats that you said, that's real. We need to change those stats and we can do that. Right. Do, but especially lot- because like, I think one of the issues is people are too hung up on six figures, like, Oh, make six figures, make six figures. I'm like y'all six figures ain't enough. Like uh, to, in 2000, a hundred thousand dollars would buy you $170,000 worth of value today. That is substantially mm-hmm. different. Our mindset has not shifted in correlation to our inflation. And so yeah. To say, I want to make a hundred K in revenue is simply inadequate. It's not right. enough. It's and not. so that can be your take-home pay. Let's set that as a base. Sure. Yeah. But that is not total revenue. And so it's mm-hmm. just, I figure, I also am a believer that like, I'm going to attach myself to people who have, who have done it before, who have, who have charged a path. Like it's why some professors I didn't connect with in college. Cause I'm like, have you built a business or did you right. just roll out of MBA school? Right. So, yeah. and then that's really important. Like it, if you want to write, I know you are an author, like I'm going to guess your coach is an author. Yeah. 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 Like <laughs> yeah. we find, find He's you written over 52 books. So yeah, I'm like, yeah, exactly. That's where I want to go. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. So it is important yeah, to tie yourself to these people. And even if they have a few steps ahead of you, that's like awesome. Right. But like to yeah. be where you want to go. And I remember even here on the island of Guam, I was like, I need coaching from somebody here that's been doing workshops and that has, as a female, has like broken the, the door as far as revenue and, and that sort of thing. And that's yes. what I did. And I chased after someone and stayed in those circles and was like, have coffee with me. And now we're like super yeah. great friends. And you know what I mean? It's so cool to see where she's gone too. And and just to be reminded, she was like, in the eighties, I was charging $120 a head. You know what I mean? Like to these yeah. workshops and you know what I mean? I was like, okay, if you did that in the eighties, like, right. Right. I gotta <laughs> so, own this. yes. Yeah. So it, that is so important. So just kind of wrapping that too, is talking about pricing because yes. you know, kind of that pricing zone and mindset and everything, it goes with it. I know. And in your collective too, where you teach people really how to start and grow businesses that are freelance grant writing businesses and agencies. Um, just looking at to that pricing, right? Like what are some of the things, I know pricing is a big one I always get asked about. What are some other really big things that you get like again and again and again? Like these are the struggles that we're having starting or growing a grant writing business. Well, pricing. So we should unpack that. Second yep. would be, where do you find clients? Mm-hmm. That would be a really common question. Yeah. Let's, I mean, I think that can give us enough to riff on while I think of additional ones. Those yeah. The two big ones, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. So yeah, let's talk about pricing. Cause I was telling you in the green room, like I saw a presentation you did on society of writers where you talked about value-based pricing and did a little side note. That's what I'm going to be talking about in the nonprofit consulting yes. conference online. That's right around the corner. And Meredith and learn grant writing is a sponsor of that nonprofit consulting conference. So thank you. But I Our wanted pleasure. to bring in your knowledge. Yeah. About that. And we can also talk about the conference a little bit as well. Oh, let's do it. And let's compare notes on value-based pricing. So what we both agree on is this never charging hourly. Yeah. So we, yeah. we agree yeah. on that. Yeah. And yeah. why do we agree on that? We, because we all know that 40 hours of work in a week, if you even subscribe to that are not mm-hmm. equal hours. Mm-hmm. What do we do right before a vacation? We pull off Herculean amounts of work yeah. in 90 minutes. Or if you've got little, yeah, yeah, you're like speed doing, yep. Catch it. You're 20 minutes. Exactly. Right. Just do our our, work. <laughs> talk about our moms at our stay at home moms. Like they've got a nap time to mm-hmm. crush some workout and they do. Yeah. So is there yeah. 30 minutes of nap time really only worth 30 minutes of paid time? No, because they just did two hours of work in that 30 minutes, yeah. essentially. 
So that there's that, that we both agree on. So then that leaves us with, okay, but then where do you start in terms of just arbitrarily picking a number from thin air? No. And so how I think about value-based pricing, and I can't wait to see what you think about it, but I do start with the hours required to do the project because we need to at least like make sure we're covering our costs, right? And this isn't, and this would be your like, your consulting rate. So it's not maybe the $35 an hour that's your take home. What's we're billing, you know, this is the 120 an hour. You so, can never compare a salary hourly never. to consulting salary. Just don't hundred percent, hundred percent. So, and that allows you also to do like good project management of looking at a full project and understanding like what is behind this beast? What is it going to take to do this? Cause you need to have your eyes wide open to that anyway. So I do start with hours. Then I layer in, okay, what's my specialized expertise worth? What is it worth to my client? And what is the time to deliver? So I'll give an example. I worked on, let's okay, I'm gonna give two examples. One would be, I did this Indian community development block grant mm -hmm. and I didn't charge enough for it the first time. I think I charged like $7,500. Mm -hmm. the first for the first one. And then the next year, and it was successful, they asked if I would do two, but I still only had the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. So technically I wasn't really gonna, I was gonna have to eke out a little bit of extra hours with some help from mm -hmm. a contractor, but on the whole, like I didn't actually have more hours to work on and I needed to produce two. So if mm -hmm. I was only charging hourly, I would have then still made maybe let's say 8,500 mm -hmm. for now two proposals. And that would, and that effectively is leaving $7,000 on the table of value. And again, yeah. now I would charge like 15,000 for that same grant. So mm -hmm. just one of them. So, um, it goes to show that like, you literally are actively punishing yourself, the better you become. Absolutely. Another example would be, I wrote a, uh, EDA grant for this like aerospace innovation center. And I'd done what some of those EDA grants before I had a good relationship with the funder and I knew that I could get them, I thought, I thought I could get them out of mm -hmm. having to provide a 20% match because mm -hmm. of special circumstances for the nature of their nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So now they're paying me $22,000 to write this grant for them. And they're not having to come up with the 80,000 of match that they would have otherwise been on the, the hook for had they not worked with someone and who had specialized expertise. Yep. And you know the person, you know the connections, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yes, they're spending 22 K on me, but they saved 80 K on me. And yeah. so that's, you know, that's one way to look at it. And I think the trap that we fall into is that we do get better. We look at hours required to do the project and we're still technically kind of leaning on hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we spruce it up a little bit and call it value-based pricing, but it's still yeah. basically hourly. Yeah. And the last example I'll give is I have a friend that's in the aerospace and in industry. He literally helps rocket companies launch. He told me that he worked for three hours on a project and billed 80,000. And I said, wow, that's, that's really impressive, man. And he's like, are you kidding? That's 15 years of specialized experience. I know that they wouldn't have got to an answer that quickly. Like I solved a problem for them because of all that I bring to the table. And he didn't diminish his time down yeah. to like, yeah. okay, here's a $5,000 bill. He yeah. charged the full 80. Yeah. And, and that's a man, by the way, a white, confident man. And mm -hmm. here we are, I love him, but like, here we are still kind of sliding down a slippery slope. Yeah. Ultimately kind of still charging hourly. And I think that's what you and I are both on a quest to squash. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I love those examples so much. And I love the one that you're saying too, like, you know, the second year, you know, you would have only charged 85. Um, but, and, and the thing is, is even if you were able to pull some from the first year and it made it easier yeah. and you've already built that and all of the things and you're saving time and you've had another year of grant writing, say, and you just under, you know, you're getting better and better. So it's quicker and all of the things. And that's the problem with hourly, right? Because all of a sudden, the better and more experienced you become, the less you charge. What exactly. the heck? Yeah, what the heck? So don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. And, diminish, and then it's also bringing just, it diminishes across the board. I think we need to support each other to be like, you know, yeah, we are going to start charging. Because when you look at, you know, a lot of people, what they do, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is what you see people doing too, is they just Google how much do freelance grant writers make online, and they might see a couple of things. And they'll say, okay, so I think, you know, it's anywhere from $25 an hour to that. Maybe I don't have so much experience, so I'll charge $30 an hour. And it's like, oh, that is not the way to do it. 
So I love the way like you gave a formula, which is really important. And I totally lean on that too. It's like, yeah, you need to look at your expenses. Yeah, you need to look at like how much time you, and that's another thing you need to track your time to even understand yeah. how much time is going into something. But then even adding in admin time, right? And this is what a lot of freelance grant writers do. They don't look at like the meetings, the calls, the going back and forth, all of the things. They're just thinking- that I'm yours even thinking about it sitting on the freaking yeah. couch. Yeah, yeah, right. Driving in the car. Yeah. Expenses yep. are really nebulous because consultants can run a very low overhead shop. But what yeah. about the day comes when you actually want an office? When what about the day when you want to have employees in that are working with you? We've got a gal right now that's making that transition. She's been a one woman shop and she realized, actually, we gave her some a mindset homework. I'd be happy to share. It's really good stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, but so this is the homework I gave her. So mm -hmm. let's see if I can recite it. So essentially, okay. When we find ourselves, okay, here's the homework. So you take a goal that you have. So mm -hmm. let's say my, my old self was make a million dollars in business a mm -hmm. year. Then as you're writing that goal over and over and over, so don't make it a really long goal. You're going to be writing it 30 times as you're writing that goal. Every time a resistance comes up, like, yeah, but who am I to do that? I've never done it before. I don't know what I'm doing. You flip the page and you write that resistance, right? Mm -hmm. So we're writing the resistance and then mm -hmm. we're back to writing the goal. And by the time you have written your goal down 30 times, you'll have sourced about 15 resistances. And mm -hmm. these are literally the blocks keeping you from that goal. And so now we can go look at them and ask, is this true? Is it true that just because I haven't done it before, I won't figure it out? No, I've done, I figured yeah. out other things in the past, right? Yeah. And so she went through that thought exercise because she, she had this belief that like, oh, I'll just always be a one woman shop. Mm -hmm. And, and then I'll, but this little partner heart was like, boy, but I'd love to have a local office and employ two or three other women but she was stuffing it down because mm -hmm. of these blockages preventing it. And so my challenge to her on our last mastermind was like, bring the numbers for your business because now we have to make sure you're actually charging enough and everyone should, whether you're working at home or not, yeah. right? Yeah. Whether you're working at home or not. Grow. Yeah. To, to and to have that freedom to, that. to go to yeah. conferences, to go to pay for things, right? To pay for help. Um, so it's just so critical that just because you have low overhead now, not using that as your number. We want to build out that. the budget of what's like your dream operation. Yeah. Right? Because otherwise you're not going to be able to, you, it's going to be, you can get. get there, but it's going to be very difficult because you're going to be facing like, Ooh, I got to like bring this money before I get there. You know what I mean? That whole thing. Like, or you simply won't like, or you simply yeah. won't. And that's what yeah. I see happen a lot too, is like, we can break down the numbers and cut the emotion out very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a gal that was making 20, I mean, 22 K a month. Like this is epic, right? Like she's killing it, but she'd hired another subcontractor and not increased her prices. And so she's ultimately literally taking home. Guess what she needed out of it. She's pulling eight K from the business every month without a dollar to spare Oof. and working harder than ever. And it's like, okay, we can untangle this. And I'm convinced business falls into one of two problems. You either can't find, you're not finding clients, creating a consistent pipeline for them, or you're not charging enough and your, and yeah. your business model's off. Like it's one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important. That's why I think we get these commonly asked questions because that goes to with pricing and marketing, right? So it's like, so I love, I love your aspect on that. And I totally, yeah, it's the same thing. And I, I always come into it too, because I love that question is what is the value I'm bringing to the client? Because there, the other thing that trap that people fall into is, well, it's a nonprofit though. It's not a for-profit and all of those things. Huh? And it's like, they're still operating from a place of like, they have a budget, they can yeah. still create money. They have board members, they have fundraisers, they have things they can do. And it's not just you going to get the money for them. Like, it's not just the grant that's going to be an amazing change for the organization, although that's huge as well. But it's the time the ED or the other person doesn't have to work on that grant and can actually run their nonprofit. And what is that? That's time that they don't have to work on the weekends or at night. They can spend with their families. What's that value? Right. That's huge. Well, so, you're right. And, and you're kicking loose two thoughts for me. One was when I was doing a series of informational interviews, which is the method I teach for creating opportunities, literally the method you use to go find a <laughs> workshop coach. It works. Yeah. <laughs> but so I met this nonprofit leader. He's, he was the head of the most highly respected kind of nonprofit hub here in Anchorage. And I asked him, you know, what would you, what do you wish you knew at my age? And he said, honestly, 
I don't know if I would have stayed in this industry. These are, my peers have money to retire and I don't. And he was, he was sort of like, gosh, like this, I was doing it in service and I was doing it to, to give to my community. And now I have nothing to show for. And he was the most successful, highly revered nonprofit professional. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean all abandoned shit for nonprofits. Our nonprofits are doing critical work, but what it means is we are at a true tipping point that Mm -hmm. nonprofits can no longer operate under a subsidized model from all inputs, Mm -hmm. the employee time, the consultants time, the like everything it needs. It still needs to hold on its own to solve a real problem. It will, it can be viable and sustainable. And so I feel like what you and I are both kind of like leading the charge on is, is kind of tackling a scarcity mindset that is so entrenched in an industry that has never questioned that. And it's so in the wiring and we're helping, you know, I don't know, cultivate this little army of, of positive, expansive mindset people that are doing great work in nonprofits without mm-hmm. the scarcity mindset. And it's a yeah. big deal, but it is an uphill battle. Like the snowball is still very much being pushed uphill um, mm-hmm. for to, to help reverse what's never happened before. We've never had a world in which nonprofits were inherently not in a scarcity mindset until recently. Like now there's this groundswell for change, but it hasn't been that way. No, it hasn't. And, and it's interesting just to see even like the quiet quitting, like the great resignation, like all of these things are adding to that, to help push the snowball, I believe. Right. You know, and even AI, like there's a lot of things that are interesting that are in the mix that we can see this is time for change, but like it is, it is an uphill hill battle, but I love talking about it because it's so empowering, right? It's also like to say, like, if you can just, if one nonprofit can start to get on board. Oh, a hundred percent. And And then all of a sudden you've got a client list of nothing but unicorn clients. They're they're absolutely incredible. They respect your time. They respect their own. They respect their energy. That's our most precious resource. And if we deplete that, we can be in a lot of health trouble. So a hundred percent, it exists. It's out there. It is, everyone wants it. And it's just a matter of those those people matching up together and, and helping influence it elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, like you said, it is like probably the biggest sector that has scarcity mindset, the nonprofit industry. It's always like, can you do this for free? Can you do this for pro bono? Oh my gosh, that costs a lot. Da, 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 da. Like there's always, and it's just, I think a lot of it for me too, is coming in and educating the nonprofit, like, you know, like the, you know, well, no, I can't do that for free. And this is why, right. And this is what's happening. And, and a lot of times they're just like, oh, like they just haven't thought about it because they're so entrenched in that type of mindset and operation that sometimes it just takes a conversation, you know, and sometimes, yeah, there's a lot of pushback and you're like, that's not my unicorn client. right? <laughs> and we'll wait for you to catch up. Right. So, um, but here's, you know, a free blog or something still and be a resource, right. But right. that's, I'm not working with you on that, right? So I think it's a lot of times just people setting their boundaries and, and that's where that, that mindset starts, right? Like that's where you have to start from and then to create those boundaries. But if we don't do that, it's just going to spin, this snowball is going to go back downhill, right? Like if we don't Yeah, hundred percent. And I think yeah. one of the reasons we have to start with ourselves is that's actually where it all revolves out. We can go ahead and point fingers at the nonprofit, but how many of us, have no boundaries and will work evenings and weekends. I don't anymore, but let's say I I used to, right? Like if that, if that's what needed done, I'd do it. I had completely wishy-washy boundaries or would allow myself to get talked down on fees a little bit because that's what they could uh, afford or whatever. And so a lot of this actually comes like, we have to be the strength of beacon ourselves and yes. deploy the, the, the values that we want in our workplace, even if it's a solo workplace. And then once those are strong, you can stand on that when you're, um, when you're tested and then yeah. that be- it becomes more normalized, which it, it is like, we are normalizing it in my community anyway. Like this is the expectation of how you operate and everyone loves it and they're doing it and they're seeing examples of others doing it, which gives them even more strength. Yes. Cause then they're like, Oh, I can do it. I that, that, that's possible. And it's not just possible for someone way out there on the internet, but somebody in here that I know. Right. Like, so yeah, it's so, so awesome. So let's yeah. talk about marketing a little bit too. Like that's another question that you get often is where do I find clients? Um, what's, what's kind of your take on that? Yeah. What's your take? I want to know too. This will be fun. Okay. So my take is pretty simple. We teach what I call the organic networking framework and the essence of it is 
there is this timeless principle called your network is your net worth. And we all create opportunities and opportunities can come from uh, simply coming from relationships. And so mm-hmm. instead of wasting time building a website or worrying about having any sort of Instagram or social presence, all you have to do is reach out to an organization that interests you, have a genuinely curious conversation to uncover, do they need help writing grants mm-hmm. and if in finding grants, et cetera. And if they do, Hey, I can help you with that. And typically we start with, would you like a funding strategy first? So it can be a foot in the door deliverable of like, well, let's just figure out what grants you want to go after in the first place. Cause you can't genuinely price your services anyway, until you know what you're looking at in terms of, are we going after big federal grants? Are we doing state grants? What do we foundation grants, et cetera. And that also allows the organization and the grant writer to date, Mm -hmm. to spend time getting to know each other, to have an eight week project that they build trust and rapport. Mm -hmm. And in turn, when you then turn that into an amended contract to implement the funding strategy. It's a much larger contract than you ever would have started with in the first place because trust has been built and it's, it's simple. It's repeatable. You can have an existing business and still use this method. It's, you can be a newbie and use this method and get a paid, paid gig with no prior experience. So Mm -hmm. I'm just a big fan of like, keep things simple and keep things on principle versus like chasing, should I be on TikTok or should, oh, right? Like all that. So, um, I mean, we're even dealing with this right now with, uh, I'm down a team member cause she's going to, she's about to go on maternity leave. And so we're like, you know what, let's just forget about Instagram for a while. We're going to like make three little square posts that says like, we're taking a break. You can find us at like, here's our email. And we're yeah. just going like, to forget about it for a while. And I'm really quite convinced that my business is not going to hurt at all for it. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that so much. And oh my gosh, that's so much of what I teach as well. And, and, and that's what I get a lot too, is like, especially someone totally new to the table, they're like, okay, I need to build my online presence. And I'm like, right. no, that's no. Like, a long, like, that's a long game strategy. And that's not where you should start. It's always warm leads. It's always, like you said, your network and we have the matrix, right? We call it a matrix. And it, we really look at all of the people in your space, other professionals that are aligned, right? Even your friends and family, like everybody knows someone who's on a nonprofit. And that's where you start. You do not need a website. Like you said, you do not. You (laughs) You don't even need to have a business set up. I mean, my, like my methodology is like, I want you making 15K freelancing first, just to make sure you like it. You've got cash now. And then once you've got cash in the bank now, we can set up a proper business. Cause then I want you running a real freaking business. Nothing drives me nuts more than like small businesses that think they can like DIY it themselves the whole way. And then you hit a, you hit a lid and you're, you're never going to go past 70 K. So yeah. I'm all about putting some money into like a bookkeeper and accountant software, yes. et cetera. But Hey, I don't expect you to have like, let's bootstrap this thing. Make yeah. some money, just freelancing. Not at first. At first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, just make some money. Yeah, because that's going to grow their confidence too. And like you said, then they're going to know. So I love that that take on it. And that takes so much stress off of people too. It and does. And you know, your path might change. Maybe you have an, an informational interview that lights you up and you get offered an incredible job. You abandon your freelancing goals and you take the job. Like all yeah. sorts of incredible different paths can pan out when yeah. we're not attached to a certain outcome. We just are clear on how we want our life to look. And I think that's the most important thing that people need to start with is like, how do you want your lifestyle to function Yeah, and feel? And when you're clear on that, it will guide what opportunities open themselves up for you. Yeah, because you might, you know, it takes a lot to run a business and, you know, a lot of people, they want to dive in and you will easily start putting in more than 40 hours a week into your business because there are so many moving pieces. But if you set it up with your why, like, I don't want to work that much, you know, yeah, maybe you start, you're working full time still and you just start on the side and you do little things and then, and you don't need to transition just to sink all working hours into that business, but maybe you set it up so it can run at 10 hours a week. So when you do retire or quit your job, you're still just working at 10 hours a week, right? Because you've built it up to that amount. Yeah, so, that uh, there's yeah. a gap that, that come, brings to mind and she, let's see. So she was working eight to 10 hours a week on her grant writing consulting business and she did 50 K. And she was subcontracting uh, some support so that she would Mm -hmm. not go over that limit because that was the limit she wanted as a new mom. And you know what? 50K on eight hours of work a week with health is not bad. So 
Exactly. So it just goes to show like if you're clear on those boundaries and, and, and you get help and are unafraid. I mean, this just ties to pricing too. Like the only way you're setting yourself free is if your pricing is on point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. So that ties it all in. So, and you have a resource too. So we're going to be talking, we'll talk about the numbers. I want to talk about your program as well and what Learn, uh, Learn Grant Writing does. So for those of you interested in checking that out as well. So yeah, so we've kept things very, very simple. We have one program and it's called mm -hmm. the Global Grant Writers Collective. So it's a year round program. We think of it as like a three-year program with a one-year commitment and mm -hmm. it's course, community, coaching, and a certificate. So we often appeal to those that are wanting to leave their jobs and build freelance grant writing businesses. So I've taken a ton of people that have no experience and scaled them into growing consulting businesses. That said, I really love the advanced grant writer that comes in because I always can double their revenue. I, I can't, mm -hmm. yeah. and I love it. Yeah. It's a fun challenge because business is my love language. So, um, so that's been great. We've, I guess to just, I don't know how else to like unpack it further. Our community is on circle. So we are a really tight, amazing group. I think we're like 600 people now. Nice. Um, yeah. And so P I think kind of like a special piece would be our culture, which I attribute to my co-founder, Alex. So mm -hmm. she brought the culture of celebrating wins in yeah. to your yeah. point that like you often hit a goal and then you're like, well, that's it. Well, it's so yeah. much more valuable when we premeditate. How am I going to celebrate? winning my first client or increasing my pricing. And now whenever someone posts in a, a win, they also share how they're planning on celebrating. I'm getting tacos with my husband tonight. And it's like, great. Like this is becoming a cultural thing to yeah. celebrate your wins. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think that that has been powerful for the fact that these members are meeting up mm -hmm. and on their own and they're building relationships that are virtual and in real life. And I'm just like, that was to me when like the, it was like, we've done it. We've tru yeah. truly self-actualized because you probably can relate to this. Like it is so hard to get help as a grant writer when you need to have a, a helping hand. And yeah. now I'm like, now nah, you don't have to look hard. Here you go. Here's your peers. Find one that you click mm -hmm. with and you're good to go. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love that so much. I know people just come in like into the door sometimes that, you know, I want to book out my year with clients and I'm like, well, here we go. Done. Yeah. <laughs> from each other like yeah. you know oh, I got too many clients who wants this one who does you know DOA grads or whatever it is and boom boom exactly. boom like what's next yeah I love that so much so and now you're also a part of our nonprofit consulting conference and super excited happy third and 24th and we're definitely um with funding for good um Mandy Pierce and presented by Founded Technologies and of course you're one of the sponsors of our grant writing um, so we're really excited to have that. And I just wanted to ask you, like, what, you know, like, what was your interest in becoming a sponsor now that you are one? How are you excited? Like, how much excited about it? <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. I mean, so it, it's cool because, all right. So here's something interesting. I feel like I've just built this business kind of quietly in Alaska and like not paid attention to anyone or anything happening around me. Like literally we built this sucker in a tent. Sometimes we take our meetings in like a hot tub. Like I've just not paid attention. So I've come up for air and I look around and I'm like, Oh, look at this. There's a super cool nonprofit consulting conference happening. Why are we not working with them? You guys have been doing this for years too. Like that's literally how oblivious I've been. So yeah, approached you and what for me sealed the deal was I'm really impressed by your sponsors. I yeah. like your other sponsors. I think they're really interesting companies doing really cool things. And so I, I honestly looked at that as like, I can't wait to get to know them in yeah. an environment where we also clearly share the same values. And so obviously supporting you and Mandy is just a no brainer. Like we're all about supporting nonprofit consultants, growing their businesses. Um, but like really the dual benefit there to me was I'm like, y'all have some great sponsors and we're really excited to get to know them. Oh, I can't wait for it. So yeah, it's going to be amazing. So I love that you came in with that because yeah, they are amazing sponsors, just like yourself, people to network and to really get to know each other more and and all of that and to support, yeah, the nonprofit consultants out there, right? Even people who may not be grant writers, or maybe you're out there and that's, you know, one of the things you do is grant writing, but you also do board training. You also do fundraisers. You also do all the, um, so definitely, yeah, there's more roles than just grant writing to big time, nonprofits. big time yeah. and building out that network. I think of it as sort of like a constellation, like everyone has their little, we're all a star 
and we have our yeah. little zone of genius and you can form different constellations based on how you connect them. And the beauty of new age consulting, in my parent opinion, are these flash teams that assemble and disassemble. And mm-hmm. you don't have to have a permanent employee all the time. You can go find the best person to work with on a project, flash, assemble, crush it, disassemble boom, you, and you carry on and that that's happening. And I love that. And so I'm excited for your attendees to make those constellation connections. Let's call them. Yes. Yeah. So they can they definitely did last year. It was fun. We got so much after the conference. So many people still emailing, even hard mailing me cards. Like, Oh my gosh, I got so much. Out. It was amazing. I know I was like, Oh my God. Um, yes. So it was cool. And, and now we added, because of that, we added another network session this year too, cool. because we really saw the need for connection and, you know, just for people to be able to really network and find out how they can get, you know, maybe I, I don't do board training, but I get asked for it all the time. Right. Who do I know? Right. That sort of thing. Or, you know, all of the things that happen in networking. So it was a really beautiful way to do that because there's not a lot out there for nonprofit consultants, right? We are kind of operating in our own little silos. So it is nice to, I like that. I love that imagery of that like flash constellation because it's so cool. Right. And it's like a little image. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I love it. So I was like, what are we a mermaid up there? <laughs> I know, right? I know. I think about this too. It's that was one of those visuals that you know, sometimes when you this is why self-care is so important. And listeners, I hope that you're carving it out every day. But yeah. there's I consider in, in work, we have management days, mission days, and um money days. And mission days are all about like the sole work of getting away from the business to work on the business. Yeah. And yeah that's what coming to a conference like yours is all about. It's actually about getting away from your business to see your business in a new way. And for me, it was like, okay, I'm going to go out for a ski. And I just talked to Mandy who like loves Alaskan moose. And of course I keep running into a ton of them and, and I, and having this just download of ideas, like a plethora of them where all you can do is just stop and audio record them. And like, we don't get those downloads if we're not creating spaciousness in our lives. And so that's why your conference is so important because consultants can just grind and we have to step back, pause, take a moment and like allow the creativity to flow. Yeah. Yeah. I love that so much. Yeah. There's going to be so many great sessions. Yeah. On how to focus. So it's not just in the technical part of working in your business, but working on your business. On your business. So important. Yeah. yeah. So I love that. So yeah. So definitely you guys check it out. Nonprofitconsultingconference.com. We're definitely going to be there. You can check it out in the show notes as well. And then Meredith, where can people Well, it's pretty simple. LearnGrantWriting.org. Even if you're not actually learning grant writing, we just don't have a different name yet. We haven't sorted that out. But yeah, you can go to that website and find any number of ways to interact with us. Awesome. We'll definitely have all that in the show notes as well. Um, Any final words? No, but this is so cool. Thank you, Holly, for having me. I love your audience. I love everyone. It's just, this is really cool. How did it take us so long? <laughs> so I, know, I know. I'm like, we talked actually a couple of years ago. On, I think we've both just been so, like you said, that tunnel vision, yeah. like here, I'm in Guam too. I get stuck too. Like I'm here working on, working on my business. <laughs> like, We're you know, out of our gopher holes, everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I love it. So thank you so much for coming on and I will see you at the conference. So okay. sounds good. Bye. Bye.